Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Wednesday, April 28th, and we are going to be considering um, H18, which is an act relating to sexual exploitation of children. Um, this passed um, the House and um, with, the, uh, with the leadership of um, Representative Burdett, and the Senate has added a, um, was originally um, a Senate bill um, added to this bill. And so that's what we'll be spending most of our time on this morning. Um, and the Senate um, bill is relating to um, Good Samaritan protection um, for those involved in uh, human trafficking. And this is a bill that actually passed the House um, passed out of our committee last year, but the Senate did not have the time to address it. And so I'm very glad to, um, to see it back here. Um, this committee has worked on Good Samaritan laws over the years in recognition of their importance for public safety and public health. And um, so with, with that, I'm gonna turn it to Representative Selena Colburn, if you did want to add a few words uh, before we hear from our witnesses. Thank you. Sure, um, <clears throat> excuse me. My throat is a little groggy this morning. Um, this bill, as, Mac, as Representative Grad said, Chair Grad said, we um, worked on a version of this with very similar, or might have even been the exact same language that passed in the last biennium, but um, didn't make it across the finish line in the Senate, um, partly due to our COVID adjournment. Um, and really what the bill does, I think at some point we'll, we will have Michelle do a actual walkthrough, right? So what the bill does um, roughly is it says that anyone who is victim or witness of crime um, that arose from the person's involvement in and here in the bill, um, because our statute uses this language, uses mirroring language, involvement in prostitution or human trafficking, um, shall not be cited, arrested, or prosecuted and then there's a list of crimes um, that that immunity provision would apply to, and they are prostitution, prohibited conduct, and kind of lower level um, drug possession charges. And that's really the what the bill does. There's some clarifying language around how the immunity provision works. That I think it, I, it's our best left to Michelle to really give us the ins and outs of when, we, when she's available, but it's really about um, creating immunity provisions for folks engaged in sex work or who are um, subject to trafficking and just creating really pathways for, for safety for folks. And I think we're gonna hear from some really good witnesses about why that's so important, um, but I'm, I'll just say as an editorial comment, that I'm really thrilled that this language is back in front of us and can't wait to hear from our witnesses and hope we can, we can move this forward once, once again in our committee. Thank you, thank you so much. Appreciate that context. And with that, um, I'd like to please welcome Henry Eshtar, if I hope I'm saying your your name correctly? Yeah, yeah. Um, Good morning. My, my name's my name's Henry Banks. Um, I am. Oh, sorry. I'm uh, looking, at, uh, looking at your. Yeah. No worries. No worries. I think it's just a, a formality. Um, yeah. In my Zoom settings. No worries. So, first off, I wanted to say good morning to all of you and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Um, I really think in the beginning of my advocacy career that I had the chance to be part of a dialogue that's directly consequential um, to me and my community. So it means a lot that you're allowing the floor space. Thank you very much. Um, so good morning. Um, my name is Eddie Banks. I'm, Actually, I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me. sorry, excuse me. You're, um, to me, you're sounding a little crackly. I don't I don't know if other people oh, are. Yeah. Uh, uh oh. Uh, my Wi Fi might be having issues. That's, that's been a thing lately. Am I clearing up at all right now? 
you you are you are and and certainly if it's um if it's better to have your your camera off um you can you're welcome to try it that way too we just want to make sure we we hear your testimony yeah yeah thank you i appreciate that um if if you if you want to feel free to just flag me somehow if uh if my reception gets muddy up throughout this testimony and i'm happy to reiterate anything that's missed if that's helpful um am i breaking up again yeah uh um okay Okay. Is this any better? So far, keep keep going and we'll because sometimes it starts okay, okay and then so keep going and we'll let you know. Okay. Um, my name is Henry Banks. Um, I'm the co-founder and co-director of the Ishtar Collective, a Vermont-based nonprofit organization aimed at supporting the LGBTQ community, the erotic laborers of Vermont, survivors of violence and trafficking in our state. Um, I want to thank you again for having me here and for taking up this legislation. This discussion is important to me personally, um, to the folks that I've known over the years and the Vermonters that I work with now. We do see this legislation as an acknowledgement of our collective humanity and recognition by all of you, the value of our lives, the importance of protecting health and safety of all Vermonters including erotic laborers. Are we okay so far? Can you hear me all right? Oh, actually, huh. I wonder, um, do you want to try maybe signing off and coming back? I don't know if, unless anybody else has ideas, but that might help. I could, um, I could, try, I could try connecting over my phone alternatively. I'm on my laptop right now. I could use data instead of Wi-Fi. Are you, um, are you using a mic like a separate microphone I, in your headset i'm not no i'm not um okay okay i apologize for no no no, no worries this happens this happens a lot no worries okay i appreciate your you patience should... everyone sorry usually if if you call in that usually can provide better sound. Like you suggested on your phone if you called in. Hi. Is that better? So far. <laughs> okay. 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 Let's try this again from the top, shall we? I really appreciate your patience, everyone. I know working remotely has come with its difficulties. Um, yeah, so I wanna thank you for being flexible. Um, so for whatever you missed, again, I'm the co-founder of the Ishtar Collective. We're a nonprofit organization founded in central Vermont, uh, aiming towards um, the protection of members of the LGBTQ community, erotic laborers, survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking. We are an anti-trafficking organization, um, which has a lot to do with why uh, we wanna push the support of this legislation. So I really appreciate you inviting me, being, uh, inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I'd like to start with giving you all a little bit of background about myself um, and why I do the work I do. So I'm a second generation sex worker. I've been active for almost 10 years. Um, a lot of my mother's experience in the adult industry serves as kind of a constant driving factor uh, in the advocacy I do. She worked in a different generation in a different point of history um, where there wasn't a lot of language and representation accessible to her, which had a really negative impact on her, her mental health and her general well-being. Um, and having lived to witness that, um, it's kind of inspired me to want to change that environment in hopes that we as a community can kind of come together and ensure the protection of all workers across the spectrum. Um, at the heart of this bill and the advocacy I do is a vision for that collective protection. Um, we use the word community in Vermont a lot, and for many, 
what that looks like is friendly greetings and shovel driveways. Um, but for people like my mother and my friends and I, I think about what it looks like to look out for each other when things get hard. Who can we turn to for advocacy when things get dangerous? Um, and that's kind of the driving point of why I'm here today. Who do we trust to ask for help? Um, we do live in a country where consenting sex workers, partners of sex workers, and even their hired security could face trafficking or prostitution related charges should the law get involved in a bad date. The life that I live personally is ruled by a constant risk assessment. So it means getting creative when vetting a client. It means dropping my pin to friends in case I disappear, because I know if I were to call the police, the possibility that I would be arrested myself is very real. That arrest could be published or broadcasted along with my legal name. And in the small rural towns of Vermont, the stigma associated with these types of public shamings could likely hurt my ability to find stable housing or employment outside of the adult industry. Um, when I was dancing only a year and a half ago in a legal and regulated space, I was assaulted by a client while negotiating dance prices. I did immediately report this incident to security, but security had been paid off by that client. Um, this is just an example of ways that this bill could protect people in the event of exploitative activity. Um, so recently there were attacks in Atlanta on establishments perceived to be places of sex work. And regardless of whether or not those victims were sex workers themselves, eight people lost their lives that day. And the shooter had plans to go and attack a pornography set thereafter. And we all know pornography is a fully legal and regulated form of sex work. If violence against a fully regulated, or if violence against fully regulated sex work and those even perceived as doing illegal sex work is going up, such as in Atlanta, then it kind of begs the question, of what do we need to do differently for those that we've lost who don't end up making the evening news? So in the days following Atlanta, my attention's been brought to an uptick of assaults in the sex worker community across the nation. And here I see my siblings in the industry closing around each other for that protection that community offers. Unfortunately, none of these victimized workers will see justice through the legal system because their trust in the law enforcement has been strained given the choices that we have. Everyday sex workers must make a calculation, risk my health and safety or risk my home or my non-sex work job, my schooling, my freedom. In these instances of violence against people in my labor community, I saw images of my colleagues' faces broken and bruised, some requesting funding for surgery or relocation. And the tragic fact of the matter is that their assailants will not be arrested because to report their assaults would incriminate themselves. What they might be, be asked would be things like, what were you doing at the time? Why were you there? That kind of brings me back to the Good Samaritan Bill and the importance of it. I wanted to talk a little bit about instances of human trafficking um, as members of the local government. It's no mystery to me that this is a concern for you um, as it is for us at the Ishtar Collective being a vehemently anti-trafficking organization. So the Good Samaritan Bill could be a multi-layered power of protection here in Vermont. It could be preventative and not just reactive. Not only would it allow sex workers and survivors of trafficking <sighs> Um, confidence to report a crime they are a witness to or a victim of, but they can also use this law to de-escalate a, a potentially dangerous situation. An erotic laborer who knows their rights under this law could feel confident in calling the police before the moment of violence, or they could their, or they could evoke their right to call in the police if they feel a client is exhibiting behavior that would warrant police action. The fear of arrest would no longer be a tool of coercion for a client or a pimp to use in order to exploit a worker or survivor, which is a common tactic of exploitation. We often get asked things like, who are you going to call the police? And we do have it ingrained in us, the idea of you're a quote hooker, they won't believe you or they will 
arrest you first. That is why this bill gives us hope. It says to us, we're human and we deserve to be safe and alive. It says that the Vermont government cares about that. Furthermore, in coercive relationships between trafficking victims and their traffickers, this legislation will provide these victims a way to freedom from exploitation without fear of arrest. Currently under the law, su survivors of trafficking are often arrested, while the narrative in the courts and the media is one of rescue. But is there any other scenario in which someone who is being rescued or liberated is handcuffed and put in the back of a police car, later to be put into a cage? Our duty is to stop this hurtful, hurtful response to victims and survivors of human trafficking. And I do believe that this bill is a very, a very important first step. I do take pride in my residence in Vermont, knowing that our history is one of leading by example. The passage of this bill changes the dialogue between working people in the industry and the law. If we can work together to protect all of our laborers in Vermont, we can build trust and combat the life-threatening violence. What we have here today is an, example, is an opportunity to further build our state's legacy of working together across the political spectrum to create change. Um, sorry. <laughs> We were a part of spearheading the, the effort to give marriage rights to the queer community, and we have already given good, a Good Samaritan bill for persons with substance use disorder. Vermont party already put in place a law to protect detainees from, uh, from sexual assault by police because our state does recognize that nobody has the ability to offer real sexual consent uh, when their freedom of movement is being controlled by police custody. This was a good step into establishing trust with the police and the Good Samaritan Bill is a gesture for sex workers and trafficking survivors to give that trust to law enforcement as well. I wanna thank you all again for your acknowledgement of our humanity. Um, this bill does affect more than just the sex worker community in Vermont. It does again offer an element of protection of people who are being coerced in, in exploitative situations who might not have the language or legal resources to seek protection. Um, I'm open now to any questions anyone might have and thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you so much and, and um, it was perfect. Your, <laughs> um, all technology problems were, were solved. So I'm really, I'm really glad that, um, that we could see you and, and, and hear your testimony and so appreciate your your courage and being a voice for your community and your industry and um, and your safety does matter um, matters very very much and um, and the ability for community members to to trust law enforcement um, has always been critical but is especially critical um, in these times and so I I thank you for your for your advocacy um, on this bill so thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any hands i members. You'll have uh, to excuse my assistant here. She, she wanted to uh, show up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> any of us have assistants. We, we, we love <laughs> meeting each other's <laughs> assistants. Sweet. Um, okay. I'm not seeing any, um, any hands at, at this point, but um, okay. I, um, if, you're, if you're able to, to stay with us, it's, um, that'd be wonderful. And um, folks may have have questions later, so. Yeah, and I am open for any clarifying dialogues as to what trafficking actually looks like in the state of Vermont. Um, the part of my job with the Ishtar Collective is to help demystify the image of the sex worker um, and also bring to light truths about the trafficking pandemic in the United States. Um, some organizations do offer a lot of misinformation suggesting that trafficking in the US is largely of a sexual nature. So if anyone has any clarifying questions about that matter, because it is a really important issue and our organization wants to be on top of advocating for the protection of everybody, I am here for that. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, uh, David Mickenberg, good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Um, sorry, I just couldn't pull up my... And this, this may be the first time we've See you this session. I don't. I'm not sure, but but good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. Um, sorry, now I'm having technical difficulties describing my testimony. I'll be right with you. I apologize. Um, here we go. 
Um, thank you for being here. Happy to be here for the first time um, this session. Um, my name is David Mickenberg, and I'm here today on behalf of uh, Decriminalized Sex Work, which is a leading national organization advocating for the end of the criminalization of sex work. Um, and I'm happy to be here to talk about this sp specific provision. Um, to, be, to be clear at the onset, um, we are anti-trafficking advocates at our core. Uh, we believe that part of the anti-trafficking effort is the separation of adult consenting sex work from criminal human trafficking, but that that is not before your committee today. Today, we're here supporting a small provision that would extend the harm reduction policies called Good Samaritan Immunity that you've act, enacted around drug policy um, to sex workers. Um, at its heart, this issue, like the work I've done for almost two decades on drug policy, is about harm reduction. Inherent to this approach is an acknowledgement, setting all moral judgments aside, of the reality of sex work as part of our state, our nation, and our world despite its ongoing criminalization. And once we acknowledge that sex work is part of our society, we must then ask the question, how are we able to best deal with the potential negative consequences of such work? Um, right now, as many of you I'm sure are aware of, and as Henry just alluded to, um, Vermont has an active sex work marketplace. You can see that by searching Vermont Escort on the internet to see sex workers advertising. And because this work is happening in the shadow of the law, sex workers face a lot of challenges verifying the identity and the safety of clients before they engage with them. Um, giving sex workers, as this provision does, the ability to contact law enforcement without fear of prosecution will empower those workers to advocate for their personal safety in a way which remains unlikely under our current laws. Um, leading human rights organizations such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the Open Society Institute, the Human Rights Campaign, and the ACLU have taken strong positions in favor of policies that will reduce the harms associated with this work. Countries throughout the world have begun to implement harm reduction policies associated with sex work and legislatures around our country have begun to seriously take up harm reduction policies associated with this work. In fact, in the last few years, California passed legislation uh, that implemented similar language to what you are considering today. And New York, New Hampshire, Washington State, Rhode Island, and Washington DC have all organized efforts to improve sex work related policies. Um, finally, the legislation you're discussing today really is anti-trafficking legislation. By allowing for the issue of sex work to come out of the shadows through a Good Samaritan law, we are able to focus needed resources on those human rights abusers that are coercing and forcing people into sex work. And we are empowering workers to come forward and work with law enforcement to root out these individuals without fear of prosecution. Um, at the end of the day, there should be public health provisions enacted to reduce the harms we must, uh, um, uh, we must ask is, are, sorry, we, we must ask the question, what are the harms associated with sex work, including sexual violence, public health issues, work conditions, and the collateral consequences of an arrest. And we appreciate that this bill looks to the public health approach and work to respect the lives and dignity of those that are sex workers in this state. Uh, the Good Samaritan section of H18 will provide a life-saving outlet for sex workers and those that are being hum human trafficked to help ensure their safety. And it embodies the harm reduction principles that Vermont has embraced in other areas of the law. Um, that is it. I'm happy to answer any questions and appreciate your good work on this really public health and life-saving legislation. I would just add, um, we've seen, and actually I personally experienced um, the Good Samaritan Law in action the other day um, when I found somebody on the street um, passed out who had uh, had a, a drug overdose and I felt totally comfortable calling 911 um, and calling the police knowing that um, whatever uh, situation he was in, the most important thing 
was making sure that he was safe and alive and all other factors uh, would be taken into, into account later. But um, this, this bill is really in the spirit of, of that legislation, prioritizing the lives, the health and the safety of Vermonters first and um, understanding that that's the most important thing uh, that we can do for folks. So thank you so much. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Absolutely, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, David. And yes, it is about saving lives and public health and, uh, and public safety. So thank you. Uh, again, not seeing any, any hands. Uh, okay, um, Chris Fenno, Center for Crime Victim Services. Good morning. And Chris does have um, written testimony that has been posted. Yes. Great. Good morning. Good morning. For the record, Chris Fenno, Executive Director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Um, I, I too w applaud uh, this piece of legislation about um, the Good Samaritan piece. And, and it's important to realize in the context of safety for victims that, um, that this is a historical kind of uh, threat that, that people use, that trafficking victims are told you will be arrested. Victims of domestic violence are told by their abusers, you will be arrested, you're the crazy one. Nobody will believe you. It's it, you know, all of those power differentials that we see um, really breed on that. Uh, and then you add a layer of potentially of uh, substance use abuse um, and that it all gets very confused. So that said, in that context, the center does support this legislation. Um, we currently uh, have an initiative with the federal government on uh, creating and supporting the Human Trafficking Task Force in Vermont. And, um, and then we have two particular case manager positions that we support one in South Burlington and one in um, Rutland. So uh, we are through this human trafficking task force, their subcommittees um, are really looking at what trafficking looks like in Vermont. Um, up until we, the time we got this grant, which was two years, about two years ago, um, this group really looked at just sex work and, and people who were being trafficked for sex. And when we got the grant, we established a, a labor subcommittee and that has been very active in trying to get people to the table, to get law enforcement to the table, um, to really uh, create policies and procedures for uh, responding to victims of labor trafficking and how that will look. Because they too were told, if you call the police, you're the one who's gonna be arrested. So the police really are used in all of these situations as a threat. So um, having this piece of legislation that would say, hey, you can call the police, you're a bystander, you, it's okay, we're not gonna arrest you if you have drugs on you, if you, um, if you were engaged in, in sex work, all of those things will support victims and survivors. Um, in addition to the work that we do on with the Human Trafficking Task Force, um, it is a joint effort with the Vermont State Police. So um, we had to, we had that was by design. The federal government said you need to have these two entities work together, and so um, they got to hire a person. We got to hire a person, and then COVID hasn't really helped. So, um, but we are uh, we're happy with the policies and procedures that have come forth so far. Um, the center's real uh, interest in this was to see where we might make an impact around funding um, because there, uh, up until three years ago, there were no services that the, that the center was providing specifically for people who are trafficked other than those who found themselves involved with either the sexual assault or the domestic violence programs. Um, if a person reports to law enforcement that um, they are a victim 
or a witness to a crime that arose from the person's involvement in prostitution or human trafficking, we believe the person should not be cited, arrested, or prosecuted for a violation of these offenses. So that's why we support this. Um, we also know that currently, and it shouldn't be uh, where you find yourself living or find yourself working that um, you get either protection or not protection. So we know that there are police departments that don't prosecute, but it's, it's not um, across the board and it shouldn't matter where you are in Vermont, you should get the same response from law enforcement. And this bill will do that. And that is why we support it. I can certainly take any questions and I can hang out in case people have questions later. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, it's very helpful. And, and you know that uh, what we call is geographic justice, um, which goes to your, to your last point is, is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara, are you? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Barbara. Um, thank you. My, and my question is probably for both um, Henry and for Chris. I'm wondering if um, like word is out on the street that certain law enforcement officers are okay to call and um, if they've been utilized. I've, I'm also wondering, I'm assuming that... Um, we have both um, that we have an array of gender um, uh, sex workers. And I'm wondering if it's been difficult for male se sex workers, like more difficult also um, to ask for help. Um, and also understand that there's a lot more activity online. And so I guess I'm wondering I'm assuming if somebody is doing business in Vermont, either on either or both ends, that this would, um, the Good Samaritan laws would apply to them. So that one might be for, for ledge counsel. I can certainly uh -huh. speak. Um, okay. I, can, I can certainly speak on, um, just the general relationship between people in the sex worker community and law enforcement across the board. I will say historically, um, there's, there's not really um, a vetting system in place for officers of the law who are safe to contact. Um, and I've never been in a legally difficult situation where I could call 911 and request one officer, right? Um, Furthermore, in the state of Vermont, um, arrests that are docketed up in uh, public documents um, are more often, like they are disproportionately cis-gendered male um, in the sex worker community that that part um, of our demographic is grossly underrepresented um, and with our current like cultural understanding of what domestic violence, trafficking and predatory behavior looks like, um, more often than not, even in non-sex work related um, incidents of domestic violence, if there is a cis gendered male present, they are more likely to be prosecuted um, for, for acts of violence and abuse. Um, this, this is in part just our, our dialogue of what violence looks like um, across the gender spectrum. But that is again, why Ishtar Collective has wanted to reach out across um, all, all spectrums of gender and sexuality. We want accurate representation of every sex worker's experience, at least in the state of Vermont. We do work nationally with other coalitions, um, L1, down in New Hampshire that deals with um, sex workers across the region of the Northeast, as opposed to Ishtar, which is only statewide. Um, I'm newer at this part of advocacy. A lot of what I've done is grassroots and because the nature of our labor is so criminalized um, and so buried, especially in the Northeast, it's been a real challenge 
for us to get um, effective outreach to those to those members of our community for their, probably for their own fear of security and arrest, um, which is another reason this bill is so important for us all to understand really what other nuances are in place and the differences between trafficking and sex work. Um, so we get a better understanding of laborers that are being exploited across the spectrum. Um, this Good Samaritan bill says that Vermont takes interest in what that looks like. I hope that answers some questions. I'd like to hand the floor over to Chris now. Thank you. I would say um, that in Vermont, it's a, I haven't heard that there are certain law enforcement officers that are safe or you could go to. Um, I think that it's, uh, we see it more regionally. We know of regions where people who are being trafficked are arrested. Um, I think that where this lies right now in Vermont is still with a feeling of rescuing people. And so not really listening to what um, the this, this victim or survivor wants to happen. So we have heard stories of people being transferred to another part of the state and held in, in jail for their own safety. Um, those kinds of things all erode um, the self and the sense of self that we would hope would be there. Um, law enforcement doesn't have the same uh, goals as we have. Um, you know, they, they don't. Um, and so all of the education and um, ongoing conversations are important. But the one thing I know about law enforcement is that they try to follow the law. So that's why this is uh, an important piece of legislation because if they, if they don't wanna do it, that's one thing. But if this law is on the books, then they're going to be held accountable for that. I don't Let's know if that answered your question, but. <laughs> yeah, that was, thank you. That's very, very helpful. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, Selena. Um, I have a question that's, that builds a little bit on that. Um, and I'd been thinking maybe I would hold questions to the end and hear all the witnesses. Um, and this might be a question other witnesses want to answer to in your testimony as you come up. But I know that with my own, my, I say my, my, my community's police department, um, speaking to the issue of how, how police apply these laws and um, the question of geographic justice, which I really appreciate you bringing up um, so much that they, when, when we had a change in state's attorneys in Chinning County, um, not, I just wanna be clear that neither of the state's attorneys, um, former, the, the previous one or the current one in Chinning County prosecute um, prostitution charges. But I remember the police coming in, in our committee at one point, um, members of Burlington police and saying, we really hope the new state's attorney will start charging prostitution um, charges because it, it was such a problem that um, they, well, anyway, so, and their rationale was like, because that is the only way we can help people. And I would just, I hear that a lot about questions of criminalization and decriminalization around sex work and drug possession. And I just would love to hear, especially Henry, but but any witnesses, like what is your response to that sense of, oh, an, an arrest is a mechanism to change, you know, get someone help. Um, Cause I hear it a lot. Um, well, first off, so nationwide, um, Last updated check I saw in 35 different states, it's perfectly legal for an arresting officer to engage in sexual activity uh, with a detainee. Um, so even with that understanding as a nation, as a national trend, I would say, you know, um, absolutely not. Um, to be arrested is, it's a really traumatizing event um, and in my past experiences with people who have been criminalized and arrested, um, they haven't been in situations where they felt 
that the officers involved had proper de-escalation training. Um, it wasn't it wasn't a diplomatic affair. Um, and also, we could look at the history of drug use in our nation and across the globe and the effects that harm reduction has versus criminalization. When we put people through the prison industrial um, complex, um, for instance, I have a sister uh, in Missouri who's about to be discharged from a federal penitentiary. She spent the duration of the pandemic incarcerated. Um, she lives with substance use disorder. So she was arrested for a victimless crime. She was not distributing, she was using. And instead of putting her into a rehabilitation center, which was offered uh, by the defendant, the defendant's attorney, my sister's attorney, they put her back in prison. This is, I think, her second time being incarcerated. That really speaks volumes to me, the effectiveness of harm reduction versus incarceration. Um, substance use disorder is a disease, uh, but today we're talking about trafficking versus consensual sex work. Consensual sex work is a career path. Um, it is a valid form of labor. It's one of the oldest in the, in the planet's history. Um, and it hasn't gone anywhere despite any attempts to criminalize it. Um, and the further that we criminalize sex work, the further we get away from understanding the differences between trafficking and consensual work. 80% of the trafficking that ends up happening in the United States is of an agricultural or service oriented nature. It has very, very little to do with sex. That isn't to say that coercive relationships don't happen between workers and their pimps, their boyfriends, their landlords. We hear stories about this all the time, but unless we offer protection towards people who are in coercive relationships, meaning they are making decisions to engage in sex work, but under the threat of outside violence. So they're still, you know, consenting to an act of prostitution on paperwork as our laws understand it, but they're not doing it of free will. So until we go towards a direction of harm reduction, all we're going to see is people processed in and out of the prison industrial complex without rehabilitative services, without harm reduction services, without mental health assistance, without access to trauma care. And what we see when that happens is people going back into prison. They don't learn their lesson. They don't turn their life around. They don't report their abusers. They go back into prison with a felony. You know, they don't, they don't have access to work. They don't have access to housing because of a felony charge or a gross misdemeanor charge that would be on their permanent record that people do request information on. Really what we do when we put people in prison is we debilitate them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was such yeah. a helpful yeah. response. Right, thank you. And uh, and also you, you touched on um, tourism and, and agriculture and, and those are two industries that, that Vermont depends upon. And uh, I remember years ago when, when we first looked at human trafficking and, and um, looking at a state law and, you know, the reaction was, it, it's not here. Why, you know, why do we need this? Um, it, was, it was here then and, uh, and it's here now. And uh, so we certainly have the environment for it. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Barbara. So, um, Henry, thank you for your words. I mean, I, I, it's important um, for me to say to our committee that we all know that when somebody gets incarcerated in Vermont, we're not guaranteeing their sexual safety um, as we have witnessed um, through reports of assaults happening in prison, just like you referenced um, law enforcement in many states. So not only are people at risk of getting raped from their um, co-inmates, but from staff as well. And there, it's sort of the irony of locking the person up and for their own good. Um, I also just want to say, I know um, from clients that um, I've worked with in the past, when they have been public about 
being a sex worker, um, either in court or um, in the media, they've needed extra protection. And it's it's just been unbelievable. I, I was both surprised and horrified at um, what was happening right here in our, in our city and state. And, um, and a lot of these people are under age, which I know adds another layer of complication, but um, yeah, I, it, it's, this is really important. So I really appreciate um, everyone's efforts to bring this to us again. Thank you, Barbara. Um, okay, so now welcome Kara Casey, the network. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Um, I apologize for any traffic noise. I was also having some technical difficulties this morning, so I'm outside um, an office. Um, thank you so much for holding space for these really important conversations today. Um, my name is Kara Casey, and I'm the Director of Economic Empowerment at the Vermont Network. And um, I'm here to speak with you today in support of the language from S103 that was added to H18. Um, as some of you may remember in 2019, um, the network, the AG's office and the center were directed to um, review and make recommendations on the modernization of the state's um, current prostitution and human trafficking laws. And um, this policy came out of, was one of the consensus um, that came out of that group was to um, adopt a law similar to our liability, our immunity from liability in our overdose prevention law. Um, we see this bill largely as a victim safety bill and anti-trafficking. Um, the immunity from liability in H18 is an important step in ensuring that if someone ex who experiences or witnesses a crime, especially a violent crime, they're able to seek support and justice without fear of being prosecuted for engaging in prostitution. Um, furthermore, it will provide immunity from a variety of drug crimes for these individuals. And um, as you've heard, that's, that's really important. Um, the network believes that when crafting policy, we should listen to those that are most impacted. And as you've heard today, um, and as we've seen um, nationally and in Vermont, those engaged in sex work are advocating for policy change in order to increase their safety. Sex workers and victims of human trafficking are particularly vulnerable to sexual violence and physical violence. This policy aims to reduce the harm experienced by sex workers and victims of human trafficking who are reluctant to go to the police because of potential arrest. And I wanna highlight that this bill does not provide immunity from human trafficking charges but it may, however, protect the lives of those who are experiencing human trafficking. Um, so uh, I just wanna thank you again for the opportunity to speak in support of this bill. We believe it's a small but important step in protecting some of Vermont's most vulnerable community members. And um, we look forward to having more conversations about this in the future. Um, and I just wanted to reiter reiterate that conversation around um, that Representative Rachelson brought up around um, incarceration. Um, so we know that investing in um, really investing in communities and in investing in harm reduction and supportive services for folks is really the best way to um, support them and, and not incarceration. So I um, wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can you remember questions? And not, not seeing any at, at, at this time. So, so thank you very much.